It's easy to hear your favorite artist on WFPK from wherever you are. Listen on your smart speaker, live stream from our website at WFPK.org, from Louisville Public Media. Consequence Podcast Network. And welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks to all the subscribers for checking us out every single week. Always appreciate your comments in the various places that you can hear this from. Uh, if you can uh, give the series a rating, that's always a huge help. Huge, huge help. Of course, if you're not a subscriber, uh, take that moment before we get started here. If you like the interviews with uh, musicians of all different genres and styles, all your favorites and what they're up to, uh, it's a great series to follow. Of course, you can grab us in all the major spots like uh, iTunes, Apple Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, Acast, Stitcher, Podchaser, any of those places, wherever you get your podcast from. Just type in Kyle Meredith with and you'll find us and you can subscribe. New episodes every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. I'm Kyle Meredith. Today, my guest, Caribou. I'll be talking with Dan Snaith about the new record, Suddenly. Now, this is his first record since, like, early part of last decade, or mid part of last decade, anyway. Not that he hasn't been busy, and he'll tell us about the whole process of uh, really never stop working on this one, even while his other musical identity, Daphne, you know, was up and roaring as well. We get to hear about the sounds he gravitated toward this record, especially in contrast to that previous one called Our Love. He'll tell us about really getting away from that sound. And leaning on R&B, all to R&B, there's an exciting movement in pop happening right now, uh, embracing the weird, really going in a minimalism direction for a lot of artists. So we'll get deep into that kind of geek territory right there. And Dan's process, too. Uh, as the story goes, he says there are 900 draft ideas that went into this record. What does that mean? I've got to ask what that means. And then we'll get into the themes of it. Uh, the first single, Home, is this really, really great track built around a Gloria Barnes sample that even features an assist from uh, Dan's friend, Fortet. So Dan's going to tell us about uh, his and Kieran's working relationship and the overarching theme on this record. Is it an album about loss? It seems that way to me, but of course, it goes much deeper than that. Dan's also going to give us a, a little tease on what the upcoming Caribou Tour is going to be like as well. So let's jump into it to talk about this new record called Suddenly. It's Kyle Meredith with Caribou. Hi, Kyle. It's uh, Dan Snaith, Caribou, calling. Well, Caribou, you're back with Caribou in a, in a new record called Suddenly. As it goes, you know, you've got several different musical identities. Why was it time to bring Caribou back again for this new record? Well, I, yeah, I record music under the name Daphne as well, which is more focused on dance music, club music. Caribou for me is the kind of home base almost. It's like everything that I love musically and much more of my personal life and it ends up in there. It kind of represents everything that I love about music is in there and all the stuff um, that I'm going through. It's it's all, Caribou's the main one, I guess. The other ones are kind of aliases for kind of specific, Daphne's a specific purpose, but Caribou's the main thing. So I've been working on it for a few years, the little bits and pieces gathering together to make this this album. I'm always, I guess I'm always working on it. That's working on something, a new Caribou one. As soon as we finish the tour for the last one, I'm desperate to get back into the studio. And even if I'm doing other things with Daphne at the at the same time, the Caribou stuff is always percolating along. Working on it at that pace, was it surprising to you that there was such a gap between the last record and this one? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I think there's a few reasons for that. I've had a kid, uh, my, our second daughter in uh, in that time period, so having a little baby and having those extra responsibilities. Also, some of the things that end up on this record, you know, predominantly were having more responsibilities to people around me that went through various crises in my family and my parents getting older and, and just needing to be more tuned in to those things and not so singularly focused on making music, um, having a more balanced uh, life. So that, that definitely meant that it, it maybe took longer than it would have. But also, I guess I'm in no rush anymore. I've released six albums already. This is the seventh uh, album under this alias. So, I, And I have a sense that having made, so made, made quite a lot of music, it has to add something. I have to feel like I'm totally happy with it. Otherwise, what's the point of making... There's a lot of music in the world, and what's the point of um, releasing it if, it if it's not something that I really feel like is is the best thing that I could possibly do? I'm, I'm happy you do that because it has, uh, I don't think I've thrown an actual compliment your way, and I should have at this point because it's made for a really excellent record in this. I mean, 
you know, for, Thank you. as they say, uh, uh, worth the wait, I guess, is the phrase. But uh, <laughs> I'm glad you say that because it would have been the worst case scenario is you take forever <laughs> and you release a record and everybody hates it. So I'm glad. That, yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm super happy with it and I'm glad other people are, are it's resonating with them, too. It's not always fair to compare and contrast against the previous records, but seeing where you came from on on the uh, on the last record with Our Love, was there a central sound that you were gravitating towards on this one? Because it doesn't. It doesn't sound like that one, obviously. No, yeah. It was it was actually more of a kind of feeling that I wanted to move away from that record. Not because I wasn't proud of it or happy with it, but just because I felt like I'd done that. The, the last record for me was kind of the most maybe glossy, shiny, condensed version of my, my sound, like the most pop in some sense uh, version of my music that I'll probably ever make. Everything, every kind of corner was, was smoothed down and every surface was polished till it shines. And this time around, I was like, well, you know, I, there are lots of kind of along the along the way of in the process of making an album there are lots of things that happen accidentally and kind of be can be a surprise can be a left turn in the middle of a song or something like that and i was like let's embrace those things that i would have when i was making our love i would have kind of smoothed them over you know made them more digestible or whatever and and it seemed more exciting this time because i'd done the opposite to go to go in the other direction and I, I think you can hear that on the on the record. There are certain points in different songs where you know the whole the genre shift from one second to the next, and the one section of the song is very different from the one before it. And that's that kind of plays into that title too. I think I've read you talking about because a lot of the tracks they do they just they just veer off uh, sometimes slightly and sometimes jarringly, especially right at the end, just when you think you've got a grasp on the song. You just yep. throw that whole thing out with, with thirty seconds left or whatever. Yeah, I you know I th- I feel like that's also. I also increasingly uh, in recent years, I want the music that I make to kind of fit into a kind of not replicate what's out there already, but kind of be have a dialogue with what's out there in contemporary music. And the way that music is put together these days, you can do those things. You know, if you were recording a band in a studio, a kind of live take off the floor, it's 1964 or whatever, then you can't do that kind of thing. Whereas now you can really, you know, have different worlds living within one song, you know, and, and that excited me and made me thought, well, I haven't really explored that idea myself. And it feels like a, a kind of contemporary thing to be thinking about. So yeah, that gave me some inspiration too, hearing it in, in other people's music. Maybe it's because the first single was, uh, you know, with Home had the Gloria Barnes sample on it and everything. But but do you lean a little bit towards R&B or, or even alt R&B uh, on this record a little bit more than usual? Like I hear it also in, uh, you know, a little bit in a song like uh, New Jade. Uh, did, mm-hmm. did that sound come in more so for you? Yeah, for sure. This this I mean, in uh, I, I guess the history of the last you know, a couple decades of contemporary music. For me, the the place where the most musical innovation innovation has happened, but also the most like relevant sound that's been the kind of contemporary pop music is hip hop and R and B. And 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 you know, a lot of the when I listen to to the most popular music, I'm often not listening to like, oh, that's the idea that makes it have one billion streams or whatever. I'm listening to the idea to be like, okay, what's underneath that? And quite often, you know, in that genre of R&B and, as you say, alt R&B, there's kind of a sense that, it, you know, there's something very popular and populist about it. But then underneath the kind of production or the instrumental sounds are often quite bizarre and, uh, and different, which is, for me, is super exciting to juxtapose something very immediate, very like an earwormy kind of thing against a sound that is you wouldn't expect to hear there. And, and that kind of sensibility and, and taking that exactly in the track, you know, New Jade's a good example of taking that idea of kind of juxtaposing the popular, the kind of familiar and the unfamiliar in a, in a way that relates with, with hip-hop and R&B, that kind of music. I mean, what you're saying there is one of the most exciting things for me about pop music as well, because I think when we look back and we, you know, however history writes it, uh, whether they can pinpoint the moment or not, and, and I've got my own theories, it's exciting because I think we are in a time where pop music has embraced weird so much, mm-hmm. and, and minimalism on totally. top of that weird, you know, it's a... It's a good spot to be. Yeah, it's I, I 100% agree with you, and it's a good spot for me to be because that's exactly my taste. And I kind of realized I released an album called Swim in 2010, and I thought that was like my weirdest record that I'd ever made. You know, it was just you know I was made. I've not really ever made any kind of concessions to making popular or palatable music, really. But I thought that was a super weird one, and that was the one that really caught people's 
attention more so than the previous ones and kind of moved things up to a different level for my music reaching people. And that was, you know, that's a real vote of confidence or kind of boost to me to be like, okay, that you know, that I can see her in the musical climate around me. And with respect to my own music, you don't have to be safe to kind of connect with people. People are up for things that are weird and interesting, which for me as a music fan and a listener and a music maker is like, yes, that's, that's, that's so good. Right. It's, uh, yeah. I, I know we're veering off on a tangent here, but that's one of the most confusing things because there's still a lot of there's still a lot of generic pop out there, and, and it seems like there's still mm-hmm. a lot of artists who subscribe to that, like, that's the way you have to do it. But it, it's almost like if you take that look, the ones that stick around, the songs that make the most impact and eventually become classics are the ones that, you know, have that mm-hmm. bizarre whateverness to them. And it's it's kind of confusing. They don't really grab onto that. More more artists don't grab onto that a little bit more. Yeah, I think you're right. Those That kind of music endures. And also... It's also symptomatic, I think, of being in a time when there's more music around than ever before. So if you make a song that is catchy, but it sounds like 10 other songs that came out that week, what's people's incentive to keep listening to it? What kind of reason do they have to have an emotional connection with it? Whereas if they hear something that they've not heard before, you know, it, it will be compelling and interesting to people. And I think that's part of why we're kind of where where we're at with music as well. Yeah. Well, bringing it back to the album suddenly. Hey, let me see if I got this uh, number right. Um, 900 draft ideas went into this record. Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I here's here's my process on a very kind of day-to-day level. I I mean, from when I was a teenager, I've always just loved sitting down at an instrument or with a kind of way of recording music, recording sound, and just coming up with something out of nothing, that kind of generating genesis of something uh the very beginning stage is always exciting and interesting to me like what's it going to be today i'm going to sit down i have no kind of preconception or idea I just start playing around with things and that happens really quickly you know it's not like a there's no kind of thinking about is this going to be on the album is this going to be a finished song is this something that people will think sounds like caribou etc cetera, etc cetera. it's just fun it's a kind of like exploration and playground so if I do that, you know, it's been five years since the last record, maybe the last three I've been working on it every, every come down in the studio. I have a little basement studio in my house, come down here every day, make one of those or two of those every day or most days. Then the, the insane sounding number of 900 drafts starts to make sense. You know, if you, the, those, the days pass and those things add up. And then I just have this huge collection of ideas. I mean, it's definitely not like an efficient or sensible way of making an album, but it, it's the way I love doing it. And for me, it, that's the most important thing, like doing the way that is the most enjoyable. And because that's when the exciting things happen is when I'm kind of least thinking about, oh, there's a deadline and there's a, a record label waiting to hear it. You know, I, I just need to be kind of in my own little world experimenting with, with sound and playing around with melodies and ideas. But then the, I guess the problem is there's so much music there it's very hard to see from that point to how to get to, you know, there's 12 tracks on this record. Um, that process is, or, you know, and they're all half finished at that point. So it's like, which one do I even work, keep working on? You know, it's, it's sometimes hard to tell. I mean, some, sometimes like with Home, I had a sense that, oh, yeah, I'd love to finish this one. It's so catchy and emotional and evocative. But some of the other ones, uh, I kind of I have to rely on people that I trust musically in my life. So it's my wife and Kieran Hebden, who re- records as Fortet, are the two people who I know will be totally straight with me. And they can listen every few weeks or something. They come over and listen to some music and be like, oh, yeah, yeah, that that one that you've made recently sticks out. And they help me that process of kind of winnowing down to a, to a, an actual album. It's kind of interesting that having that many different pieces that you would even allow a track like the uh, Filtered Grand Piano track, which is, you know, seemingly just one little piece to take up an entire section where you would have so many other parts left over. Well, that's a great example, actually, of what I was just talking about. So that was in the pile of discarded pile in the garbage trash can, so to speak. And then when all of the other music on the record was done, and, you know, the other ones were chosen because they were like tracks that I really loved that had something unique and different about them. And I started putting them in order, and that was, and Kieran came over and was listening to them. We were kind of listening to them in order. And he was the person who said, let me hear what you made that's just like super mellow, short little bits and pieces, because there's this one spot here between these two tracks that have very different moods, and it needs something like just a bridge, something to kind of pace it. It almost feels like a 
a breath, like an inhale and exhale between two tracks that were beside one another. And we found that piece. I was like, I couldn't, I mean, literally, I didn't even remember making that piece because there's so much music. Uh, but, you know, I probably made that really late at night, just very simple idea. Um, and it just fit perfectly and kind of had that role of pacing the way the record fits together. So it, sometimes it does help to go back to all those bits and pieces and, and remember, oh, yeah, th this could be useful for a specific purpose. Yeah, to actually making it an album which, you know, is important. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned Karen, and, yeah. and, and Fortet actually gets a, an, an official assist on home. Uh, how was, uh, mm -hmm. what, 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 what was the story there? So, yeah, the, the, that's, that track is obviously built around a loop from the, an old soul record that you mentioned earlier, Gloria Barnes, and track also called Home. And I kind of made this loop, and I cleared the sample and made a bunch of versions, figured out, you know, like, this is the structure of the song. And I'd been sending versions to Kieran, and we were both like, yeah, this is kind of exciting. It's different from anything I've done. And it's like a short, condensed song. It has a, you know, genuinely has a song to it, not just an instrumental loop. And everything was kind of falling into place. But I didn't know there was kind of two different treatments that I'd done a couple months apart. One with like a, a kind of hip-hop breakbeat over the whole song. So it's more tough sounding the whole way through. And then I'd done a version that was me playing drums in a kind of more subdued, soft kind of sound, which gave it a more kind of folk soul kind of thing or so, a different mood, a more mellow mood to it. Uh, and I'd sent those two to Kieran and I'd forgotten that they were, I'd sent him the two of them, honestly. He emailed me back and was like, oh, I actually think the thing that could be kind of cool is if it goes back and forth between those two moods and when you're singing, it's because I sing in a kind of more subdued or intimate style. It's more mellow and subdued in those parts. And then the drums kick back in when it's the instrumental part based around the loop of Gloria Barnes singing. And he was like, you know what? I, I Normally, it's we have these kind of conversations all the time, but he doesn't actually get his hands on the, the music and and play with it directly. But this time he was like, I can just hear exactly what I'm thinking. And you've sent me these two versions of the song. So he just chopped them together, kind of edited the parts that he wanted together. And that was the final. I was like, oh, man, it's one of those examples of being so close to something you can't see it. It's like, man, that's just, it just makes so much sense. The, the mellow mood suits my vocal so well. And then it's good to have the kind of excitement of the drums coming back in. So, yeah, in that case, he was, uh, I've often been like, you know, you give me so much advice and feedback, what kind of credit can, you know, I've I've wondered what kind of credit to do, but this time he did like a very specific d defined job. That's the job of an arranger. So he's credited as an arranger on the track. Yeah, and it, it's an absolutely beautiful song. And, and when you get into, you know, sort of listening to those lyrics and, and I think you'd in maybe in the press release talking about you know a song about picking up the pieces and starting again and putting it in the bigger context of the record i i do have to ask is, is it an album about loss well you know it's it's funny there's i guess partly symptomatic of my age and the kind of stage of life that i'm at there have been a lot of uh there's, there have been a couple deaths and family and friends close to me there's been a divorce and this song is about somebody you know, not uh, well, breaking off a relationship that was toxic as well, and escaping from that and finding themselves again. And so, yeah, there there is a lot of those themes in it. But somehow, when I listen back to it, I don't hear it as being a sad album or a kind of. There's a lot of melancholy and difficulty in it. But I, I think what I realized was I, over and over in the last five years, I ended up being the person that people were turning to for support and for comfort and to be there for them. And that that's the mood that I hear in the music most often. You know, it might be about something sad, but it's about making something optimistic. Home's a great example because, you know, this was actually the best thing for the person who left this, their relationship was to be, be free of it and be able to start again. And that's the mood that I hear over and over again about taking hardship and making something comforting and warm and reassuring out of it, some kind of optimism. And I, I, for the people that I'm writing it for and writing about, but also for me, I think, you know, that was, it was a kind of therapeutic process coming down into the studio here and, and making that, making something that had that role for me as well, kind of helped me process things and make, come out of it feeling 
optimistic in some way. Yeah, well, it definitely plays like a journey, and I think that's you know one of the things I love about all of my favorite records, and, and it's probably hopefully something that I think the artist kind of wants to get out of it. And by the end, you know, where are we left by the end of Cloud Song? If, if it is a journey, if you even stacked it like that, are are we kind of presented in some specific spot by the end of the final track? Well, the, the interesting thing about it, so the last song to be made on the record was the first song, The Sister, which is the kind of an intro. It's, a lot of my albums start bang in with like a the single or like one of the you know more immediate songs on the record. This one felt like it needed something to kind of in, introduce this journey into it when I was trying to put them together. And I I went back and I kind of listened to Cloud Song and I thought it'd be nice if the beginning and the end relate. And so I used the same kind of synthesizer sound, the same physical synthesizer on those songs and something about the mood and the melodies resonate between the two tracks for me as well. So yeah, I, the Cloud Song felt like a song that kind of was a summarized a lot of things that were going on in my uh, life about kind of, given that my life was so shaped by these sudden changes, not to count on the things that you expect to happen in the future, but to make the most of the things that are there for you in the moment right now. And that's kind of what the lyric is about and that song is about. And it kind of sums up so much about what the album is about emotionally. Yeah, so in some in some ways I kind of see it as a circle because the first um, track and the last track somehow relate to each other. That's just my impression. You know, I, I guess I have a very personal take on these kind of questions. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, like I said, it, it does, it, it feels like that. And, and I feel like I could also go through and, and, and pinpoint all these little moments throughout the album because there are, do feel like so many special little, like the world that Magpie seems to inhabit musically. Uh, it's mm-hmm. uh, pure joy to me. It's not this retro sort of thing. <laughs> like all of these mm-hmm. moments in there, I, I love it. I absolutely do. Thank you very much, yeah. It is a beautiful record. I, I thank you for doing it and everything and uh, and taking the time to talk to me today. I really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully I'll get to see this out on the tour. You know what the tour looks like for this record? I mean, is there anything that, uh, y- y- you know, you've got planned to wow us? We Yeah, we're. I mean, we're we're still booking loads of shows. We've got a bunch of shows coming up already. And uh, and we're about, we're at the moment, the band lives kind of, there's four of us and we live all over the place, LA, San Francisco, Toronto, and London. I'm in London. And we're all like rehearsing our parts by ourselves. And then in a week or two, we get together and locked in a room, just playing, you know, figuring out how to take this. It's kind of a reverse engineering thing, you know, because I recorded the album by myself. And then we figure out an exciting way to play it as a band, which is a process that I always love. Yeah, I th- we've got a big new kind of visual element to the show this time around that's being designed by the same person who does the artwork for the albums. I'm super excited about it. We've, it's been a while since we've been on tour. And I enjoy that part of it so much, too, um, just as much as the recorded side of things, too. So, yeah, hopefully people will get to see us somewhere along the line. We'll be we'll be playing anywhere, everywhere we can over the next couple of years. Awesome. I cannot wait. Cannot wait to see that. Dan, again, thank you so much for the album. Thank you for the conversation today. Uh, uh, we'll see you out there on the road, man. Thanks. A pleasure to talk to you. Thanks, Kyle. All right. Take care. Bye. All right. My thanks, Dan Snaith. The new Caribou record is called Suddenly. You have to check it out. It is fantastic. And a big thanks to you as well for checking out this episode. Again, before you get out of here, if you're not a subscriber, I do hope you enjoyed it enough to keep up with the whole series. Uh, New episodes Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with uh, all of your favorite artists across so many different genres. You can just uh, grab us at iTunes, at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Acast, Stitcher, Podchaser, wherever you get your podcasts from. Just uh, hit subscribe over there, and hopefully you'll get inspired to uh, give the series a rating as well. It's always a huge, huge help. Afterwards, head to WFPK.org, where I do a show every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern, an hour full of song premieres, of music news, anniversary spins, and bonus interviews, too. Again, that's WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound, they've got your music and film news. You can also find me on any social media platform, at Kyle Meredith. And that does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network.
Hey, I'm Jen, and I love horror movies. I'm Mikey. I'm dead inside, and I also love horror movies. And we really like to torture our friend Todd because he hates horror movies. That I do. And that's why they call me the horror virgin. <laughs> that's the only reason we call him that. I'm not, no other reasons at all. <laughs> None oh, at all. Lengy. Whatever. So every, <laughs> <laughs> every week, we take him through the encyclopedia of horror, the good, the bad, the ridiculously Jack Frost. <laughs> and then we make fun of it, more or less. Or explain its deceptive feminism. Oh. Yeah, exactly. That's what I do. That's my thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the funny one. <laughs> Our episodes drop on Monday, so check us out.